blessing of the Lord be upon you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. Boy, that's something, isn't it? The book of Proverbs is unique in its composition. Why is that? Well, it's classified as Hebrew poetry. While for the most part being pithy sayings with little interconnectedness. Boom, 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 boom. Here, here's this saying, this saying, this saying, this saying, this saying. But in sections such as Proverbs 9, 1 through 6, uh, where a common theme is expressed, it must be approached as Hebrew, as, as poetry written in what? figurative language. And one of the beauties of it is to figure out what the figurative language is expressing. What, what is meant by what we just read? Well, we'll talk about interpreting the Bible a little bit tonight. One of my favorite things to do, and I'm not saying that I'm always 100% right, but uh, this is one of my favorite little lessons here. Because in this little poem, wisdom is pictured as the worthy woman or companion as opposed to the foolish woman who is also known as pleasure, right? We have that throughout the scriptures. You have the worthy woman, and that's going to be expressed in Psalm 31 in a rather long poem about the characteristics of the worthy woman. But, but here, you have the worthy woman, and she's a companion. She's somebody that you need to be around, and in essence, she's wisdom. Wisdom is like a worthy woman that, that you need to be married to, that you need to have in your company, as opposed to a foolish woman who's simply in it for pleasure. And you see that lots of times in the Psalms. One of the great places in the Bible that expresses this is, of course, in the book of Revelation, where you have uh, Jezebel on one side as being that foolish woman who's based upon pleasure, and on the other side you have the woman expressed as the church. The church, and the church just not the church in the New Testament time period, but the church all the way back through. All those faithful who bring forth Messiah, that, that scarlet thread that we talk about sometimes, that coming all the way through, those two opposed, and at times that foolish woman, that Jezebel is, is even expressed as a beast, or beasts. But this wisdom, pictured as the worthy woman, this companion, she builds a grand house, or we might say a mansion, or a temple, and figuratively, that's a virtuous life. Seven pillars or virtues hold up its porch or entry point. If you had, if you studied art, one of the things they start with in art class is actually studying architecture. You study the buildings, and there are those pillars with the different types of capitals on the top of them, but those pillars mean something, and those pillars hold up the porch, and the porch is the entranceway, and if the, the entranceway isn't uh, supported, if it isn't strong, and if it isn't 
beautiful, aesthetically beautiful. People don't want to enter into it. So wisdom builds that house, and, and it's got those seven pillars that are there. And, hey, it's, it's like you want to go in. You want to see what's in this because there's those pillars, and it's grand. The house is a solid house of stone, and it's built on a firm foundation. And inside this house is a banquet hall where a grand feast is set. Everything necessary to su sustain a virtuous life is provided there. You get that picture? You see that in those first couple verses? Wisdom has sent out her women or her virgins, some translations will say, to invite everyone to come feast in Wisdom's house. Wisdom calls for everybody. That's an important point. Even the simple, the most infantile of individuals can benefit from feasting in wisdom's house. So, well, wisdom doesn't want those simple people. Yes, that's what wisdom's there for, isn't it? Come here. Feast for a little bit. Hey, if you just get a little bit, the next time you come, you might get a little bit more. Because that's the point. Even the simple... benefit in wisdom's house. To miss it, you've really got to be foolish because it's there and everybody's invited. All must pass by and when they pass by, what's the first thing they note? Well, it's the seven pillars, right? It's the seven pillars holding up this porch and there's that grand house outside of it. They must enter, or I'm sorry, a virtuous life does not come just by learning the virtues. Aristotle talks about this in his book, Nicomachean Ethics. I hope I pronounced that right. That a person can study ethics. And a, a person can study about virtues. But if he isn't practicing the virtues, he's like a sleepwalker. He's just walking through. He, he knows, but he doesn't practice. So a virtuous life does not come simply by learning the virtues. Come in and learn a little bit about the virtues, but when you go out, hey, you've got to practice them. Because if you don't, you're just the same fool that you were when you came in the door. That makes sense? Well, sure. They must enter in and taste or experience the goodness of the virtuous life. That's why the doors are open and the, the women, the virgins are out there. Hey, come on in. Even you simple people, come on in. It may take many visits to Wisdom's house before virtue begins to even grow. You know, you, you've got to plant a seed first before you get a plant to grow. A good plant. Weeds just pop up anywhere, but but a good plant, you, you, you got to you got to sow the seed. For some, it may never come though. For some, they 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 may reject it. They may just come for the the feast and that's the show and that's over. You know, entertainment purposes, whatever, and they're gone. But it doesn't take root. Yet wisdom's message is concise and powerful and reverberates through the ages. And you know what that is? Stop being a dying fool and start living a virtuous life. That's what wisdom is calling. And that's what wisdom is inviting everyone to come to the feast and partake of. Seven pillars of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 2 through 6. What are they? Proverbs 1. It says one. Proverbs 1. 
That's what I said. Proverbs 1, no, verses 2 through 6. That's why we were questioning. Hmm? You said Proverbs 2. Proverbs 1, 2 through 6. There you go. <laughs> replay. <laughs> Instant replay. Just say it. Well, I've got it there. Okay. But you didn't say it. Here's what it is. The seven pillars of wisdom. To know wisdom and instruction. To understand words of insight. To receive instruction, wise dealing, and righteousness, justice, and equity. That, my friends, is discipline. To give prudence, number four, right? Mm -hmm. uh, next, to give prudence to the simple. Knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance, number seven. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. There are the seven pillars of wisdom. Wisdom and instruction. What's that? Well, ethical and religious discipleship. E even if all you're doing is partaking of Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics or the old Greek ethic. That's some type of ethical, religious discipleship. But partake of some of it, something, somewhere. Have, have something that you're leaning on, not just the sands out here on the seashore. Have a solid foundation. Start somewhere. Believe in something. How about believe in someone? Believe in God, the creator of the universe, who created the solid foundations of the world. Yes, he created the sands and the seashore also, but not to be stood on permanently. Wisdom and instruction. Understanding words of insight. What's that? Well, that's rationality. How to think and communicate properly. Do you think there are a lot of people in the world today who are rational? They don't know the difference between a man and a woman? What, it's 64 different genders? <laughs> it's... It's mind-boggling, the lack of rationality in people today. Now, it's always been there, but how widespread it is today, and, and especially how the, that irrationality is in leadership positions, in government, in institutions, even in so many churches. It's almost unbelievable. Understanding words of insight, so very important. Discipline and righteousness, justice, and equity. These things aren't inherent in human beings. That They're learned from God. We're not naturally righteous. Naturally, we want our own way. We want to do our own thing. Justice? I want to do what I want to do, and I want... It, it's not do unto others as you would have others do unto you. It's, hey, I want to do unto you what I want to do to you, but I don't want you to treat me bad. That's their form of justice. Equity? Of course, equity is equal treatment before the law. That's what biblical equity is. Equity today is take from the rich and give to the poor. Take from uh, the uh, ones who have oppressed in the past and give it to the oppressed. That's, that's equity. Where true equity is equal standing before the law. and Give everybody the same chance to be successful. But discipline, that takes a discipline of mind, a discipline of body, a discipline of character to 
hold to those principles of discipline. You have to be discipled. Discipled by who? Discipled by people who know and understand righteousness, justice, and equity. And they stem, they come from God. Prudence, which is foresight and understanding, or foresight, it's understanding the consequences of actions. That, that if you do wrong, there are consequences for that. Where's that gone in modern society? Where is that gone in the United States today? That there's hardly any consequence for bad actions, even against the law. Just don't do it again. You probably learned your lesson. Being caught and brought here before the judge, you probably learned your lesson. I hope you've learned your lesson. Go home. Yeah, they've learned a lesson. I get away with it. No, there are consequences to actions, and eventually there's going to be the great judgment. And we're going to have consequences from a judge who says, I'm not putting up with it. You, we're not having that in heaven. No way. Knowledge, number five there. It's not until we know God that we can truly know ourselves. I'm not talking about trivial knowledge here. I'm talking about knowledge. A true knowledge, an understanding of God and what God has done, how God has created this universe, how God has created us, how, how God desires a relationship with us as individuals. That's so very important. There are so many who have convinced so many others that we're nothing but animals. So we treat others like animals. Yet you're just an animal to be studied. Well, if we're animals to be studied, who's studying us? Other animals. But they think themselves as superior animals because they're studying us. They're not. They're not superior. What gives them the right? They say, you shouldn't judge me, but if they're studying <coughs> us and they're making these decisions, aren't they judging us? So we need that knowledge of who we are so we can demand our rights given to us by God, given to us by our Creator. And then there's discretion the ability to think critically see you've got rationality at one point think properly but then think critically and that's lost in society it's lost in culture what's the difference what's the difference between a zippo and a hippo A hippo is heavy. The zippo is a little lighter. <laughs> terrible. I know. It's <laughs> terrible. Z and H. But but that's that's a point of thinking critically. <clears throat> Remember the cartoon that Danny showed us the other day about the curtain being torn from the fence. Well, without a little bit of context what what would well with that little bit of context then ah here we go it's about the curtain in the temple being torn from top to bottom but thinking critically about things is so very important and that might be why it's one of the last things there because it is so so difficult and to think critically that takes time and that takes effort. To, you know, we've got to burn some calories <laughs> to get into that realm. And then the guidance. That, and after all, when, when it's all said and done, guidance. The humility to seek and... Well, let's break some of them down. 
Let's examine the seven pillars. Instruction, ethical and religious discipleship. Proverbs 9, verse 10, the very first part of that. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the proper disdain for sin and awe of God's goodness and love. That's what the fear of God is. The awe of God's goodness and love. It's like a respect. But that's where ethical and religious discipleship training comes in. If we don't know about God, how could we understand about ethical things? How could we truly understand about religious things? Now, I understand there are earthly religions. There are religions that stem from the earth. Atheism. There is no God. Well, a belief in that means that you've got a religion that's just about the here and the now and what exists. The five senses. What kind of a person are you going to be? Can, a, can an atheist be moral? Sure. Can an atheist be ethical? Sure, in many ways. But where did they get their morality and where did they get their ethics? It still came from God. They just don't want to admit it. They want to say, well, if that's just the way people ought to treat one another. We, we ought not to murder one another because that's not nice. Gee, God put it a different way. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. It's pretty good. But until you get that ethical and religious discipleship to actually practicing those things, it doesn't make any difference. You, you can go feast on that forever. But until you practice it, it makes no difference in the life. Instruction. Understanding words of insight, rationality, how to think and communicate properly. Proverbs 4, 7 through 9. The beginning of wisdom, we're still talking about those early stages, right? The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You want ice cream? Get ice cream. Hey, that's that's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. You want a soda? Get up off the couch and get a soda. If you want wisdom, get wisdom. And whatever you get, Get insight. Don't, just don't stop with getting a pearl or a gem of wisdom. Let it sink in. What does it mean? What's, what's behind it there? Get the insight of it. Look into it. What does it mean? And how can I apply this in my life? Now, prize her highly. Why? Because if you do, she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. That, that means make her a part of your life, right? She will place you, uh, she will place on your head a graceful garland. That, that's a winner's crown, right? She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. That's that's a crown of that's like a royal crown. We don't need an earthly king if we can rule ourselves. That's why Franklin and Jefferson, two, two supposed deists, out of all those men who signed the Constitution, developed the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, whatever, okay, declared that, you know, with the Republic, it, it's for a moral people. A people of immorality cannot exist as a republic. You've got to have morality. You've got to be ethical. You've got to be wise to rule yourselves. Some people need a king. 
They need somebody telling them what to do. They need a dictator. They need an autocrat. Because they don't have the wisdom to rule themselves. But there, there, here's the person that can rule themselves. Wisdom helps us judge what is important, meaningful, purposeful, all those things. Be wise enough to seek wisdom. Not seek somebody to take over your life for you, but wise enough to seek wisdom. And when you find that wisdom, walk by it. Because that's the path that Jesus walked and would have you to walk. Discipline. And in righteousness, this is what it says there in, what we say, chapter 9? In righteousness, justice, and equity, things not inherent in humans but learned from God. The International Standard Version of the Bible says, For acquiring the discipline that produces wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and upright living. Okay? Discipline helps you acquire things. Or, or I'm sorry, yeah. For acquiring the discipline. These things go together. They mesh together. Wise behavior is righteousness. What does that mean? Acting within God's will or in accordance with God's will. Justice is acting with right reason deter to determine actions just or unjust. Is that right or is it wrong? Is this action right or wrong? A sense of justice will tell us Okay. If I don't like it being done to me, that's probably wrong. So I shouldn't do it to others. That would be a just one little part of being uh, showing justice. And equity, applying equal justice to all. Friends and enemies and self alike. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Again, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. And how does that come to us? Well, it comes through chastisement, reproof, warning, instruction, restraint. It should start in the home. It should continue in society with friends, in school, in the workplace, wherever. But that's where discipline has its place and bringing us to wisdom. Whoops. Prudence, foresight, understanding, and consequences of actions. Proverbs 1, 11 through 15. I said Proverbs 1, 11 through 15. For the naysayers among us. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Verse 15, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths. Be prudent. You know what's going to happen if you do what they want? Number one, you might be the one who gets bloodied up. Or you might be the one who gets arrested and tried and convicted and sent to prison or even executed. Think about what your actions could bring to you. Now, in the long run, piety. Piety's good, isn't it? Piety, proper reverence for God, helps us obey God out of love. Piety is a prudent thing. Piety in this context and text piety in this context involves reverence, trust, and a humble dependence on God's wisdom and guidance. Think about Joseph when Potiphar's wife is constantly after him. Come lie with me. Come lie with me. I cannot do this to your husband who's my master and I can't do this to my God. It's wrong. The prudent thing. Did he know what was going would happen if he did commit adultery with her? Yes. Did he know what would happen if he didn't? 
Yes, but what? He chose the one, the lesser of two, okay? He chose the right way, even though it would bring him harm. In the long run, it brought him good. God was able to make good out of that, where God wasn't going to make good out of his adultery. So, prudence. Number five, knowledge of God. It is not until we know God that we can truly know ourselves. Proverbs 9, verse 10, the second part of that. The knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Insight. You, know, you want to know what's in you? Get knowledge of God and what God has done. Hey, go back to Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the earth and then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being, a living soul, nefesh in the Hebrew. You want to know what's inside you? It's what God put inside you. Once you realize you have a soul, once you realize you've got something precious in you, it can make a difference that you're just not an animal. That the Lord God took time to make you. How wonderful that is. Knowledge helps us to know God, and in that way it helps us to truly know ourselves. Discretion. The ability to think correctly. Did I say something wrong? It's critically. I thought you said correctly. Okay, critically <laughs> and correctly. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 2, second part. Only to you. To understand words of insight. It's one thing to, to uh, have words of insight, but to understand them. Discern in the Hebrew means to separate, to make distinct. Discernment is the ability to look at a situation and clearly see all its moving parts. If you can see all its moving parts and then you can understand it and you actually have that prudence then, well, if I do this and this happens, then this over here can happen and that's bad. If I do this and this happens and I can do this and then that'll work out for good. That's what a discerning mind, that's what it needs to do, have that ability. Now, one person can look under the hood of a car and see an engine, not a motor. Well, mine's got a motor, too, because it's a hybrid. Engine is gas. Motor is electric. I know. Some people call a gas engine a motor. They're not thinking critically. All right? Or correctly. But they look. They open it up. Oh, a motor! Right? No. An engine. A mechanic opens it up and looks at it, and what does he see? That's a bolt. Crankshafts, camshafts, pistons, connecting rods. Why? Because he's looking at it in a different way. He's looking at it critically. Okay? My wife says, the coffee pot doesn't work. Is it plugged in? Did you press the on button? Did you do this? Did you do that? Whatever. Okay, just throw it away and get another one if it doesn't work. But, but you see, you come to that. The car won't start. There's something wrong with the engine, the motor. I'm going to look at what? The battery, the battery cables, what have you. You see the difference? Thinking critically. Now, from the big picture, come down to the smaller picture. Look at the individual things. And I think that's what this discernment is, is doing because there's so many things in life that you need to discern to uh, 
separate these things, distinguish the different moving parts. And Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, talks about this. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. There are people who can read the Bible clear through several times, and they still won't know the difference between good and evil. It's not until they digest what the Bible says and then start putting it into practice to understand the difference between good and evil that they truly can distinguish good from evil. Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Apostle Paul writes, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Got to have knowledge before you can have discernment. So that you may approve what is excellent. Approve what is excellent and disapprove of what is not excellent. See, that's the same same point, isn't it? And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. That's going to be the day of judgment, isn't it? Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That discernment, knowing the difference between good and evil, that's going to make a big difference on judgment day, isn't it? We've got to put it into practice. Know it. Practice it. Guidance, humility to seek and use good advice. Proverbs 15, 22, without counsel, plans fail. But with many advisors, they succeed. What does counsel do? It helps us differentiate between right and wrong. I may not understand it. Ethiopian eunuch, right? He's traveling. He's been to Jerusalem. He's got a copy of the book of Isaiah. He's reading it. Do you understand what you're reading? How can I accept some man guide me? We all need guidance at some point. And the book of Isaiah, unless you know Old Testament history, unless you know what's happening, what we're studying, even about the uh, intertestamental period, what we've studied in the minor prophets, without knowing that, you open up the book of Isaiah and read it, it's like mishmash, mishmash, whatever. What is it? What, what, what's, what's he talking about? And, and then when they do it, they want to apply it to today. No. No. Get counsel, and that helps in this process of wisdom. Oops. We cannot connect the seven, I'm sorry, we can connect the seven pillars of wisdom to the seven Christian graces. Think about it. I know it's not complete, it's just not, and it may be skewed a little bit, but, but just listen to this. For 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What, 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 what's that? His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and God. He's just given it to us, right? Through knowledge, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. That's what Christ has done. By which he has granted to us his power precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Hallelujah! His divine power has given me all this stuff. <coughs> he just gave it to me, right? Just keep it on me, right? Wrong. What does Peter say? For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, manliness, or courage. Virtue with knowledge, 
knowledge of self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. What has he given to me? He made them available to us. Now it's up to us to get them. Same thing with salvation. I hope maybe someday the brethren, I say brethren, the folks who believe in uh, salvation by faith only would come to an understanding that the gift of God's salvation is conditioned upon us receiving it, accepting it. Verse 8, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to conform your calling, I'm sorry, confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, if you practice these qualities, if you practice these qualities, Sound like a broken record there? It's the reason why. If you practice these qualities, just not know them, not just memorize this set of verses, if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Brethren, who have been adopted into the kingdom of God by the new birth, who have heard the gospel, believed, repented, confessed, and baptized into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. If they will practice these things, these qualities, they will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You notice Peter starts off with virtue and lots of times that's courage. It's translated courage. A man by the name of Samuel Johnson said, Courage is reckoned the greatest of all virtues because unless a man has that virtue, courage, he has no security in preserving any other. Unless we have the courage to practice these things, then they're no good to us. Proverbs 28, 1 through 5. A wicked the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. That's courage. When a land transgresses, it has many rulers. Why? Because they get knocked off, right? We've studied about some of them rule for eight months, like Smyrtus. But with a man of understanding and knowledge, its stability will long continue. A poor man who oppresses the poor is a beating rain that leaves no food. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law strive against them. Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. Hey, there's where knowledge and knowledge of the Lord really helps. Strength of mind and spirit enables one to endure adversity with courage. Courage may simply be the will to say no when the whole world is saying yes. Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep step with the Spirit. How do we do that? Enter in. To wisdom's house through those seven pillars of wisdom and feast often. Often. Thank you for your time and attention. That's our lesson for this evening. I hope you enjoy that as much as I enjoy putting them together and hearing it myself and something we need for our